Good evening. I want to thank everyone here for having me, the priest and religious of Mount St. Michael, and all of, all of the Fatima Conference guests. When I was first asked to give this talk, I honestly wasn't sure where I would begin. Regarding the climate, you often hear the phrase, the science is clear. Man is responsible for global warming. Now let me assure you firstly that the science behind global warming and climate change is anything but clear, but I do hope to give you some clarity and peace of mind tonight as we delve into this topic. So let's get started. I want to start off by asking, why are we here? Somebody earlier on actually gave me an excellent answer to that question. We're here to know, love, and serve God. Not only is that our duty, but it's a basic human need. We don't feel complete without God. He made us to be completed in his love and in an eternal relationship. Everything in our lives was provided by God to us for that ultimate end. Observing the two great commandments gets us there. That is the right order for our focus, and everything else falls into place. But we're here today because political factions are attacking the communion of saints and saying that God is not even real. He's not a unique being. He's far from personal. All you have to do is watch the largest news entertainment companies such as CNN, MSNBC, BBC, Reuters, etc. The mention of God in anything other than a, an attack is taboo. There's a lot of political candidates running for the presidency in the United States of America right now. Some of them mention God, and when they do, they are outright mocked. Um, that's the world we live in. Again, we're here today because Francis Bergoglio came out with an encyclical on climate change, global warming, whatever the latest is as far as phrasing it. And we're here today because his political organization and many other large political factions in the world, including the New Order Church of the 1960s, does not and, and does nothing to protect the rights of God and the moral fabric of society. What's the purpose of the true church? Teach all things that I have commanded you. The new church has a fast food marriage system that is increasingly sexually vague, etc. More on that later. In the press, you will see a lot of questions. Is the New Order Church even relevant? Objective morality is being labeled an outdated ideal, and the New Church is trying something new to stay relevant in a pantheistic world. Notice I didn't say godless, for although claiming that the persons of God are not real, the world without Christ must fill its need for worship, often deifying objects. And that's a, a fault filling human history. And if I were to put a fine point on it, that is really what the, uh, the modus is behind this, or the motive is behind global warming and this, this global climate change story. Moving on, uh, you know, why is this, this topic so hot right now? Um, obviously, Francis has come out with his encyclical. There's literally billions of dollars being spent on this perceived problem. And again, I'm sorry for the long introduction, but I want to be very careful not to miss the forest for the trees. Is the root problem really to debate global warming or climate change, or is it a deeper issue? In the mid-1900s, the scare political debate was all around global cooling, actually, during a brief cold trend, which you'll see in some of the charts that I have to share with you tonight. Um, and all of this in spite of rising CO2 levels. People have been put in a state of fear by endless streams of propaganda. Does anybody remember uh, Al Gore? He was uh, a bit of a philanthropist, um, parasitic th philanthropist, if you, if you will. Uh, he was a millionaire. Oh, and by the way, he was also vice president of the United States. Multiple homes, private jet. He preached emissions reductions all to save the world. He and this guy called Bill Nye, the science guy, said in 2009 that the Arctic would be free of summer ice by 2014. Unexplainably, and with absolutely no recognition by the global warming fanatics, the summer ice has increased in 2013 and 2014. No explanation whatsoever, um, and, and no recognition of that, as I mentioned, and we still all pay the taxes because fear quickly turned into funding for the governments, for um, 
for our government and for various governments who are really touting this global warming uh, fear propaganda. Part of the problem is that all the cool guys have excluded any opinions but their own. Uh, for example, try to get a university job as an outspoken creationist. You know, it's, it's in vogue to be anti-God, to really push evolution, and to push global warming. Um, anybody who who uh, wants a, a good follow-up on that, watch the movie uh, called Expelled, you know. Um, there was an interesting character in the history of the U.S. His name was Will Rogers. He once said uh, that there's nothing dumber than an educated man once you get him off the topic he was educated on. And I think that's really true of a lot of the folks that, uh, that push this global warming thing. Most of them aren't scientists, even though they have really chosen that name to describe themselves. They've uh, taken it captive, if you will. I once had a college professor who knew everything, and he told us that the definition of the word, the word truth, was outdated and incorrect. He was one of those self-defeating smart guys who said, there are no absolutes. And uh, so, you know, at that time in my life, I was younger, I realized ego is a problem in life, politics, science, etc. cetera. Uh, and you'll see a lot of examples of that throughout history. And so this is a hot topic, again, because of the uh, political push for it, all the egos involved, um, everybody trying to outdo everybody else in saving the world. And terminology plays a big role in all of this, keeping it a hot topic. I mentioned science, scientist. Those, those terms are thrown around very loosely, um, kind of like other terms that are thrown around in, in politics, like assault weapon. You know, Nowadays, people use the word assault weapon to put fear into a populace, um, whereas you know, a pen can be an assault weapon, a spatula. Um, science, scientist. I often find these terms completely misused and very poorly defined as well. And so I'm going to give a definition here actually from a, um, a science um, book, a, uh, a textbook. Science is the systematic study of the physical and natural world through observation and experiment. Science is not something that scientists do. You can't define science by using it um, as an adverb or an adjective or some other descriptive um, name of an, another individual. You have to tell what it does. So this is leading up to use of the scientific method, of course. And we're going to, again, because we're here, we've been put in this position with the, the, the political facade of our time. We're going to use the scientific method to answer some questions and to relegate some of this fear to uh, to being essentially obsolete or, um, or, or at least take away its power. So the scientific method, those of you who are uh, familiar with it, I'm sure everybody here took science in high school or, or in some level of schooling. Um, the scientific method is pretty basic. And throughout the application of the scientific method, you see uh, three different things, uh, hypothesize or observations, hypothesize, theory, law. And that's kind of in, in order of importance. Observations in themselves don't really tell you anything, um, although they can dictate whether a hypothesis, theory, or law, you know, they, is interpreted to be true or not. But essentially, the world around us, we observe it methodically. We make observations. We might hypothesize about certain um, causes, um, etc. It, if a hypothesis has been tested and shown to be true, it may get graduated up to a theory, you know, that's described by mathematics, by uh, physical um, equations, etc. And then if that theory is found to have no exceptions, then it becomes a law. Um, there's, a, there's a few examples of this that I might use. Um, well, you might start with the observation of gravity. You know, what's gravity? It's, uh, it's a force, so we make that observation. What causes it? Well, you know, we hypothesize. This is dreaming. This is, um, you know, anything that is viable is on the table in this, this realm of the, um, or in this portion of the scientific method. So we might hypothesize that it's Martians that have infiltrated the center of the Earth and are drawing 
uh, all things to the earth or something of that nature. You know, that, that of course wouldn't make it too far in the scientific um, method. But, you know, that's a, that's a hypothesis that might, might be tested. Um, there's, a, the, there's a few things that I might throw through this method here. Um, but here, I'll finish the cycle first. You formulate hypotheses, then you test them. You develop testable predictions, you gather data to test those predictions, and you refine the hypothesis. And again, then you can develop general theories and continue to make observations, etc., in that cycle of the, the scientific theory. Um, one of the theories that I'd like to talk about is um, the theory of evolution. So, hypothesize. Um, Darwin, of course, is observing nature through the eyes of atheism, and he's trying to explain it without God. And uh, so he comes up with a lot of dreams, a lot of, a lot of uh, hypotheses. And then when they got to the test phase, they, uh, you know, there were no missing links that he was able to find. I mean, that, that term came up because, hey, his, there were holes in his, his hypothesis. Um, you know, interspecies um, evolution is, is impossible. And it, it, various times throughout history, we saw a lot of fraud, people trying to show interspecies evolution, et cetera. But essentially, that did not make it past the hypothesis stage in testable um, predictions, et cetera. It didn't make it to a theory, even though it's crammed down everybody's throat today. Um, as G.K. Chesterton once said, um, without any links, how is it a chain? Evolution simply did not make it. Uh, one theory did, did, that did make it is, is one that we're all familiar with, the theory of relativity um, by Einstein, of course. And, uh, you know, he was observing gravity, essentially. He came up with uh, several hypotheses, uh, many of them based off of Newton's earlier works, uh, but obviously taking a, a spectacularly new approach. And currently today, that theory of relativity, and again, I say theory because it still has holes, it's not a law, it still has ex its exceptions. That theory of relativity describes gravity better than any other model in human history. So there's a couple of examples of the scientific method. We're going to use this method today to look at global warming or climate change or, again, whatever PC term is out there. So let's get down to dismissing some 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 fears. Um, you know, global warming is happening. We're all going to burn up. Oh, wait, we're all going to drown. You know, there's a lot of fears that are really trying to motivate people to, you know, spend tax money to do this, to do that, to really get on the bandwagon of global warming. Um, but they're mostly groundless. For example, take the ice caps melting and flooding the continents. Um, the first thing I like to encourage anybody to do is, is call to mind Archimedes' principle. The buoyant force um, of water is equal to the weight of displaced water. Essentially, the ice caps, the ice in the oceans, they're already displacing all of the water that they would even if they had melted. So that fear of drowning is, uh, is definitely a falsehood. It's, uh, it's nothing more than a, than a fantasy you use to control people. So again, um, you know, apply scientific principles. Uh, this fear is usually brought about because there are shorelines throughout the world that are changing. You know, that there's supposedly islands in the Pacific that are sinking. Well, they say their their water levels are rising and they're being consumed by the global warming, but actually they are truly sinking. Um, and there's a viable scientific explanation for that. That's subduction, where uh, the Earth's plates move under one another. Um, and that's there's many examples of that throughout history. I would point to the city of Venice, very famous sinking city, Mexico City, Bangkok, New York, Shanghai. There's many islands in the Pacific, as I mentioned. There's Caribbean islands that are all sinking due to subduction. Now, there are other places in the world are rising. Mount Everest is actually getting taller. I'm not sure if everybody was aware of that, but it's it's getting taller. Um, again, because of this, this, um, this phenomenon called subduction. And essentially, the point that I want to make is that the world is transitory. Rain tears down mountains. I already m mentioned the plates. They change, they push up mountains, they, they pull mountains down, whatever the case may be. Uh, a great example here in the local state of Washington is the St. Helens volcano that blew in 1980. It shifted an entire landscape. 
change has been consistently observed and actually this is another law of thermodynamics the law of entropy so uh, you know it's not to be it's not unexpected my message is, is again that expect change you will see change always the world will never never be the same as it is in this very instant because it's a dynamic transitory um, world so i hope that gives you peace maybe <laughs> uh, i might joke that uh you know long before we drowned according to the global warming enthusiasts uh we might fry like eggs on a sidewalk uh it, you know at least we won't drown so let's move on let's talk more about the data let's talk about co2 levels let's talk about earth temperature first what does the atmosphere look like a lot of folks are are not aware of the fact that the atmosphere is made up primarily of uh, oxygen and nitrogen and uh, oxygen makes up roughly 21 percent of the atmosphere nitrogen roughly 78 percent and the balance is a variety of gases including argon neon helium methane and carbon dioxide and for whatever reason well i'll tell you the reason carbon dioxide gets the highest focus Oh, and that description of the and, uh, of the Earth's atmosphere is on a dry basis. You'll see this where um, as atmosphere is talked about on a dry basis because water vapor in the atmosphere changes so drastically depending on what climate you're in. Water vapor can actually make up up to 5% of the atmosphere at any one given time. That's something I'm going to come back to. But let's talk about carbon dioxide for now. It is less than 0.04% of the Earth's atmosphere. And yet it is the primary focus for tax, for environmental footprint and impact and et cetera to the global warming enthusiasts. Uh, it doesn't make up any, any sense, um, especially when you look at the heat capacities for these different elements that we're talking about, these gases that we're talking about, oxygen, nitrogen, both have a heat capacity in kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin of about 0.65, nitrogen is 0.74, um, carbon dioxide 0.655, almost that of oxygen. So if carbon dioxide changed as far as overall heat capacity in the in the atmosphere, it's like putting more oxygen. A little it's better than putting more nitrogen in the atmosphere. Um, and then you compare it to water. Again I said water can be up to five percent of the atmosphere and it has a heat capacity more than double that of nitrogen 1.5 it's it's more than double that of carbon dioxide so that's pretty key i'm going to show you a couple of graphs later on where keep that in mind it is much more important as far as it's uh it's heat capacity goes then we also look at thermal conductivity uh, this is has more to do with uh, heat over time and the rate of change of uh of heat within the atmosphere um, units would be watts per uh, meter Kelvin and oxygen nitrogen are almost identical 0.024 uh, is is their value in thermal conductivity carbon dioxide much lower honestly it's 0.0146 it's almost half really um, and then you look at water water is less than oxygen and nitrogen but it's higher than carbon dioxide, 0 0.016, uh, minimally higher than carbon dioxide. But again, it's showing that carbon dioxide is the lowest as far as thermal conductivity and heat capacity. So just from a thermodynamic standpoint, the last thing that we should be looking at if we're really concerned about global warming and approaching it from a scientific standpoint, using the scientific method, last thing to think about or even focus on would be CO2. So we'll move on to... Uh, telling a more complete story regarding CO2. On this slide here, we have a chart um, and you'll see, you'll see many of these, uh, these charts. They're from published literature. This one happens to be from a book that was uh, published in 2002, Analysis of Temperature Oscillations in Geological Eras by Dr. C.R. Scotese. Um, this is a chart I grabbed from his book because, not that I, I agree with his assertions and even his assumptions behind the chart, but it, the chart illustrates a point to the global warming enthusiasts that we need to make. And that is that CO2 levels change drastically when we look back in history. 
this chart goes back millions of years. And of course, that's why I disagree with it. I don't think the world is that old. But again, I'm using this because a lot of the global warming enthusiasts like it. In this chart, you can see the CO2 levels at the current age, the current time, are the lowest that they've ever been based on some of the current science floating around today, looking back at geological samples, um, ice samples, different things of that nature. We're at the lowest concentration that we have been throughout human, well, throughout history period, because they're looking at the Mesozoic, the Paleozoic, and the Precambrian eras. Along with that, in this chart, you can see that the temperature of the Earth has fluctuated greatly. And we're not at the minimum, but we're very far from a maximum as far as uh, temperature. And we've dropped significantly from, uh, from you know, the Mesozoic, the Paleozoic, and Precambrian eras. So uh, again, my two takeaways from this chart, CO2 has fluctuated massively, and we're at an all-time low, according to the science or the prevalent science today. The same thing with temperature. It's fluctuated drastically. We're actually at a, um, a fairly low point as far as Earth temperature, which makes sense. If, we're, um, if we look at the Earth and the, the record in, um, in, the, uh, in the ground, for example, in Antarctica, there were deciduous forests in, in, uh, in Antarctica and we see we have uh, fossilization of leaves in, stra in, in strata in Antarctica. Um, you know, th there's also here's a picture from the Wadi Al Hatim, uh, Hitan. Sorry, it's uh, a valley in Egypt where they have it's a desert and there's whale bones. So you know we know from you know the, the common literature today that there's been many ice ages throughout history. There's been hot spells. Again, fluctuations seem to be the norm and we should always keep this in mind now our world again is transitory so we'll move on again to uh, another point here where we're talking about co2 i don't mean to beat the dead horse but co2 seems to be the most important thing to talk about today in regard to global warming because again it's something that governments tax and uh and they claim it's the driving force behind man-made global warming so again, we're, we're looking at this chart here on screen. This is uh, from, I'm going to butcher his name, but uh, Jungquist, um, Temperature Reconstruction for the uh, Northern Hemisphere. And it covers the time from Christ to our present period in time. Now this is just a temperature scale. Again, showing the fluctuations that are normal, uh, surface temperature fluctuations for the Earth. And again, we're not at an all-time high. We're not at an all-time low. Um, you can see that, you know, for the first couple hundred years in this chart, the, uh, the temperature was fairly high, but then there's a big drought, uh, or not drought, there's a big um, valley, if you will, in this temperature curve, going to minus 0.5, minus 0.6, um, depending on how you interpret the... Um, the error constraints of the data and of course it's, it's extrapolated so i think they're actually overly conservative here but um, the temperature again goes through a high in the thousand year uh, period and then uh, back down to a low in the mid uh, you know 15 to 16 1700s um, again as low as a minus 0.8 off the average and then again we're up almost to a, a zero point or a, maybe a point two but again illustrating temperature fluctuation on the earth is very normal this was all or for the most part this is all pre-industrial revolution so co2 levels were fairly constant and yet you have this this temperature fluctuation so the question becomes how is the co2 tied to temp earth's or surface temperature at all i mean we already looked at the thermodynamic qualities of co2 now we're seeing actual data that says hey uh, CO2 doesn't matter in regard to the Earth's temperature at all. I mean, that's that would be my conclusion after looking at this data and applying the scientific method. And, and again, um, you know, a lot of folks try to bring up the, the drought stories. Hey, we're in this worst, the worst drought in history in the western United States. Worst drought in a thousand years. You see this quote up on the screen from the National Geographic. Worst drought in a thousand years predicted for American West. That means a thousand years ago, they had a worse drought than today or as bad. 
what was the reason for that drought back then because we didn't have man-made global warming at that time you know that's that's the question we need to ask because a thousand years ago it was a temperature high scientists who are actually smart and applying scientific methods are actually looking at the uh, that case that the world might go through thousand year cycles or maybe more importantly the sun might go through thousand year cycles um so a few things from history too you know droughts floods natural disasters they're very normal in the history of the earth it is not a gentle universe just look at the surface of the moon it's all pitted and potmarked now on the earth here you know in the u.s we're we're having a drought we had the dust bowl era in the usa in the 1920s and 30s biblical droughts they stand out pretty pretty well uh genesis genesis 41 um that's Joseph in the land of Egypt, preparing Egypt for these seven year cycles of plenty and then famine. Uh, Job 24 is another good reference to Old Testament droughts. Um, third book of Kings, uh, first book if you're in a, um, a version other than the Douay Reims. Um, third book of Kings 17 um, is a story about Elijah and how he leaves uh, the valley of Wadi al Hatim. <laughs> Um, that we already talked about, Wales. It's really interesting to me that this uh, this river, this valley, was was named after Wales, um, even back in the time that the Bible was written. Um, they were looking at these fossils. But uh, again, another the the Wadi, the river, actually dried up, and it's not a small river. So that was a pretty severe drought. And then, of course, there's references uh, throughout the apocalypse, etc. So uh, again, moving on, we want to. We want to put this absolutely to bed. My last charts beating up on CO2 hypothesis. And I'm just going to spend the last two charts here doing that and completely annihilate the concept that CO2 has anything to do with global warming. Look at this chart. Notice that CO2, this is a chart from the uh, early 1900s up to present time. CO2 is absolutely increasing. You know, that's not what I'm here to debate. The, the data shows that. CO2 is ever increasing. We're producing more and more CO2. Last I heard, that's great for plants. The other thing that we see in this chart, because temperature is plotted right along on, on the same chart, different axis, global temperature, and temperature is going all over the place. A statistician who looks at this would, would look at the data and say, there is absolutely no correlation between CO2 and earth temperature earth surface temperature which of course you know that's exactly what we were saying back when we looked into the thermodynamic data that's that's the hypothesis i would have come up with co2 has nothing to do with it based on the thermodynamic data or, or properties now we're looking at the data and that hypothesis seems real you know the data does not show correlation we have these big dips here i'll bring up another chart here co2 ever increasing but we have these massive dips in temperature uh, global air, air temperature. And, uh, you know, the global, global warming enthusiasts, they have absolutely no explanation how, with ever increasing CO2, you could have a different temperature and even a, a multi year slide in temperature. So, you know, there's no model to predict that. That's what the data says. The, the last thing we should be looking at is CO2. So, again, I want to be highlighting the cooling trends when CO2 is rising. This chart is actually. Um, a little misleading as well because the CO2 that's charted in the secondary chart is human emissions of CO2, which of course is going to be you know always going up from a, a zero point that they assume back in the early 1800s. So it looks like it has this massive growth to uh, current day, and then the temperature of course is this more or less flat line, um, you know minor minor um, minor growth in temperature during this period instead of uh, charting actual atmospheric levels because again human emissions have um, you know are only a fraction of the total atmospheric levels so uh, watch watch out for the data I, I mentioned earlier that terms are really critical and important and how data is presented is also very critical and important as to how the message is presented received and interpreted so I'm going to stop talking about CO2. We've talked about CO2 enough. I'm over CO2. Um, my wife warned me not to get too technical, but I, again, I'm, I'm the scientist. I was asked to give this talk because I'm a scientist. Um, and I wanted to make sure that we at least reviewed this data and, and gave you the scientific reasons before I got into the more qualitative reasons to debunk uh, 
man-made global warming. On, the, on this um, screen now, we have uh, the average U.S., United States average temperature anomaly, uh, pulled directly from www.ncdc.noaa.gov. This is, it charts all of the U.S. surface temperature data averages uh, since the 1800s. What do you see? You see a scatter plot um, where the average is minus 0.68, the median minus 0.52. The standard deviation is 2.19, and this is degrees Fahrenheit with a, a variance of 4.79. What this tells me with all of this data in here, again, the, the global warming fanatics, I will call them fanatics now, are saying that we're in danger of having raised the Earth's temperature by a degree F. And what this chart tells me is that's 50% of the standard deviation of the data. So a statistician would say, so it's in the noise. It doesn't matter. There's no trend that can be drawn from that that isn't artificial. So um, that's essentially what I wanted to, to share with you out of this particular chart. Um, and, and just, again, how is the data presented? Because uh, this looks like a, a flat line scatter plot to me. And there's really nobody that can, uh, that can add any more of a story to it unless they couch their data very carefully. We've been discrediting man-made global warming. I've been discrediting any use of CO2 as a cause for that. This is my first chart where I've actually talked about Earth's temperature specifically, independent of CO2. I don't really care about CO2 anymore. Um, but, you know, the question remains, are, is the world actually warming? I, I, a few slides ago, I showed, uh, showed some charts where it's very normal to have oscillations. So the question still remains to be seen. Are we in a warming trend or a cooling trend? And, you know, obviously my statement would be that whether, regardless of whichever trend, it's not man-caused, it's not man-controlled. Shall we live in fear of an impending catastrophe? Um, I've heard that the sun and earth might eventually collide too, but it won't be for a while. So keep that in mind. This is, uh, let me see, do I, yes. I have two more charts. These ones have specifically to do with temperature, how they're measured, how they're monitored. Uh, we already talked about U.S. temperature. Now on screen, I'm going to talk about this model for predicting temperature, because we, you know that's that's the thing is we're we're not going off of historical or current data. We're going off of predictions when the global warming enthusiasts say that hey, we're all going to die. The Earth's not going to be able to sustain life. We're all going to drown, etc. So um, a model is a mathematical equation. What I have on screen right now is uh, the ideal gas model, PV equals NRT. That's a very simple model. It, it predicts the behavior of ideal gases, which of course make up the, the vast minority of all gases, but it is a model. Um, if you were, we were to model CO2, uh, the, the gas versus you know, in a pre, uh, pressure volume temperature equation, it would have many, many more arguments to it correction factors, if you will. Um, the model for um, for predicting climate change, change for predicting global warming, is fairly complex and has, has a ridiculous story to it. Uh, again, this is going to be really boring, so if anybody needs to go out and grab a coffee real quick, um, I'm, I'm going over the history of how we got to predictions of hey, we're going to raise the Earth's temperature by 4 degrees C or something silly like that. Essentially, back in the day, 1979, actually, the Charney Report is when a lot of this started. Uh, again, before that, we were talking global cooling, but again, scientists can't make money off of global cooling because there's nothing that we can do about global cooling other than burn more fuel. Uh, global warming, however, has some opportunity for uh, the broke down scientist that needs money. So the Charney Report, 1979, um, it is essentially, it produced the equilibrium climate sensitivity factor. And that 
ECS factor has been used in all of the modeling and in every uh, one of the global warming environmental protection decisions related to global warming since. It's uh, also It was also the basis for the scientifically flawed social cost of carbon, which is a multi-billion dollar um, decision that the U.S. government made recently. Uh, it's used by the Interagency Working Group, which is a U.S. Um, branch that works on the, the global warming issues. Um, and it predicts essentially a global warming maximum of 1.5 to 4.5 degrees C. Now, it doesn't answer the question whether that's significant or not. It just makes that prediction. Um, and of course, scientists say, well, it's, it's the Earth. It's even a half degree would be critical without backing that statement up with data. Um, so this ECS model sustains a trillion dollar industry. All of the data sampling, all of the data analysis, all the modeling, um, all of the best practices that are then foisted upon industries, um, etc. It, it is literally a trillion dollar industry. More than many billions of dollars have been, has, have been spent specifically on studying it. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is a UN agency or branch, etc. Um, that came out with, uh, it comes out with an update every few years on global warming. Their latest was AR5 report 2013. And this is what they had to say about the ECS model. The uncertainty range of the ECS is unchanged since 1979. And all of the money since then was spent on trying to, to provide more certainty within their maximum, you know, uh, global warming range, 1.5 to 4.5 C. But this is what they have to say just a couple years ago after billions of dollars. No, this is a quote, no best value for ECS can be given because of the lack of agreement across assessed lines of evidence and studies. And then the report recommended the transient climate response model, TCR, which predicts a worst case scenario of one degree C with um, CO2, you know, dependence. So there it is. The UN has essentially admitted that after billion dollars of research that all of the models we've used today have been crap. And here is a um, here's an illustrative proof of that. This was produced by Dr. John Christie. From uh, he's a scientist from Alabama, and he gave testimony to the House uh, Science, Space, and Technology Committee. And uh, essentially, these are all the models from AR5 and proof that they're bunk. On the screen here, you see actual temperatures, and they're all less than zero plus or minus, you know, 0 0.2, 0.3-ish. Um, and then you see all of the ECS models climbing well into the, the plus two degree C range. And this is for time to date. So this is all data showing how badly these models relate to true um, actual data. And yet they're still the basis for all of this, the decisions the U.S. and the U.N. are making concerning global warming, they're the basis for the global warming ar argument, period. So, um, you know, it's, it's just a sad, sad thing. All of the data that is there, again, in AR5, the report from the U.N., use that. And this chart here, again, Dr. John Christie from the state of Alabama, showing that all of the models predicting global warming are bogus. You know, we shouldn't be we shouldn't be looking at CO2. That's again something we talked about in th the thermodynamics, in the data, and now in the modeling. The modeling just doesn't work when CO2 is used at all as the basis for uh, global temperature fluctuations and again fluctuations. So um, this is the last slide where I'm going to talk about the science and models and, and, and whatnot. Um, but again, this slide shows more more models in much better science at a much lower cost. Uh, this was put out by the Wright Climate Stuff Research Team. It's a group of 25 retired NASA scientists. Now, I'm assuming that they do have they have done their work pro bono, but essentially they've looked at the data. They've looked at cyclical Earth anomalies, uh, you know, including the Pacific and Atlantic decadal oscillations. Uh, they've looked at thousand-year um, uh, oscillations in, in that data that we have, and they've applied their own model to um, 
uh, again, the, the data from the last century, as well as looking into the future. And here's their chart. Essentially, they're predicting roughly a maximum warming of 0.4 degrees C. Nothing to do with CO2. It has to do with the natural trends that the Earth undergoes. Um, and it'll cool again after that. It'll warm up again after that. Um, it is an ever-changing world. They put out a report that was presented to con Congress. Um, it's called Bounding GHG, Global uh, Greenhouse Gases, Climate Sensitivity for Use in Regulatory Decisions. The lead author, Harold H. Dorian, uh, PhD. And again, their point, and the reason they gave this report to Congress is because Congress is making these ridiculous multi multi-trillion dollar decisions. That's how they affect our economy. Um, based on unvalidated models or, or models that have been shown to be worthless. And they, their conclusion is unvalidated models should not be used for critical decision making. Um, so there you have it. That's, that's, that's as much data um, as anybody needs to defeat the global warming alarmists. And now I'm going to show you why I don't think hardly any of that even matters. Uh, on the screen you'll see uh, these plates. They can be machined plates, for example, uh, steel plates that are stacked. And let's say that the overall tolerance is important to us. You know, you stack up four plates and the overall uh, length is, or height, is very important. It's a critical dimension. But each plate, when you machine it, has a specific tolerance. And what we have on here is, you know, plate one is plus or minus 0.4, plate two plus or minus 0.3, same thing with plate three, and then uh, plate four is plus or minus 0.5. To get the overall tolerance on a stack, you have to add up all of those individual tolerances. And that's really important here because that's what they're doing with global temperatures. Uh, temperature anomalies, fluctuations, etc. cetera. Um, you know, when we get an average surface temperature, literally thousands, thousands of different sensors. We've added to the number of sensors over time the type of sensor used has changed over time. But more importantly, the environment around even sensors that have been, or sensor locations that have been uh, in use for, you know, over 100 years, the, the, um, the specific ecosystem around that has changed, if you will. Um, you know, trees grow up, trees get cut down, cities grow up, They're, they create these island effects that everybody is very familiar with. Um, so, in, 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 again, if I'm sure everybody's experienced this. I remember when I was growing up on a farm, um, when we were up against the trees, the temperature there versus the temperature in the middle of a, uh, of a field under full sun, that temperature differential was, could be as, as much as 8 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's very critical to understand how the, um, how the forest, how the biology, how the geology around its sensor has changed over time and how that affects the, uh, the real temperature measurement. Um, not that I, I think that we could ever get to a real consistent temperature measurement, but there are people that have tried. And that's, this is what people, um, a lot of the environmental scientists are, are doing to the um, the data. So when we see charted data reported to us for average surface temperature across the Earth, it's actually not the data that's come from the, the sensor. It's corrected temperature. And there's a lot of papers out on this too. All of the all of the data charts are are put together from corrected temperature data, and supposedly to take into account the effects of these, uh, you know, island sinks, island uh, sources of heat, etc. Um, and they'll correct temperature up to four or five degrees C. Now, I say that's important because back to my tolerance conversation on the plates and the stack on it, um, whenever you are correcting temperatures by more than five, four degrees and then saying that that's a critical measurement or that 0.4 degrees is a critical measurement, you know, the tenth of your correction factor. Um, to a statistician, uh, anybody who's good at mathematics or science or anything like that is a worthless conversation to have. You can't measure it accurately enough to, to even see whether change is truly occurring or not. So from a simple tolerance conversation, there is no global warming. 
Um, I don't know how many different ways I'm going to say this by the end of the day, but uh, you know, the, there is a chart that I had in here. Um, you know, it was, it was essentially a uh, all of the global warming scientists throughout the world. They were pulled. You know, who who believes in global warming? Um, and the funny thing is, like 95, 98 percent of the uh, of the folks in um, global warming scientist roles, positions at universities, etc., believed in global warming. Of course, you know that's that's how they make their money. That's that's their livelihood. They're going to vote for um, the decision that keeps them paid. Um, and of course, when they pulled all of the scientists not specifically tied to the industry, very few, you know, less than 20% actually believe that global warming is occurring. Um, so, uh, again, what's the political motivation for the decision? What's the personal motivation for, when we uh, to interpret? You know, that's that's that's. Uh, skewing our interpretation of data um, because the only way that we can keep it straight is just by letting the data speak for itself so i'm done with data i'm going to talk about uh, a few qualitative things and a few other um, points that i want to make before i wrap up this talk uh, on the screen you'll see a map it's the puri race map of antarctica and people not familiar with this um, it's a neat story that will open your eyes to the transitory nature of the earth if nothing else the map dates from 1513 and it was assembled from much older works this much we know it was uh, assembled by a turk who was uh, actually executed probably because he used christian maps i'm not really sure um but some of the maps he used may have dated back as far as ptolemy um possibly he used other maps from the library of alexandria but this map is a map of the shoreline of antarctica it shows it in detail with enough detail to be you know for all intents and purposes exact that means the observer saw antarctica and sailed around antarctica that's pretty profound because the prevailing science science that is being pushed in schools nowadays says that Antarctica has been buried under ice for millions of years. We've never seen that shoreline. In fact, it wasn't even a mapped shoreline by any other means until the early 1900s when we took sonar down there. Um, then this this map came to light. You know, again, it was authenticated from 1513. We know the author. We know his life story. And um, the accuracy of this map was authenticated by uh, the U.S. in the 1960s after Antarctic expedition, expedition. So <laughs> the uh, Antarctica was actually ice free at one time in recorded human history. And that's pretty profound when we're talking about or we're involved in a conversation over the criticality of global warming and what what you know, dire straits we're in. The other thing that this map showed was that the map makers all the way back then knew that the earth was round. Um, the old map that this uh, Turk copied had uh, not only laid out everything out from uh, circular coordinates or spherical coordinates, but also had the earth's circumference accurate within 50 miles. That's pretty amazing. So my points, this map, the existence of this map, it debunks the irreversible global warming crisis, that message, it uh, shows that Antarctic ice is not actually millions of years old as a lot of the common scientists uh, in, in science and governments claim. Um, and it also actually might raise the question as to who mapped it in the first place. You know, maybe Adam and Eve got tired of being on land for their 800th year and decided to sail around the ocean blue. Don't know. But, uh, you know, it's, it's a really neat, um, it's, it's food for thought. It's food for meditation. So um, it's just one more, one last point that the politician-funded climate scientists have missed the forest for the trees. They're so intent on CO2, and they've missed everything else, which is the bigger picture and, uh, and more real than what they're looking at. Who audits 
the scientific method? Who, who makes sure that all the scientists around the world are actually authentically using the scientific method in, in producing real data? Well, um, <laughs> that's a good question. And you might ask the question, you know, why trust me? Am I infallible? No, don't think for a minute. I'm sharing my exercises in the scientific method for you to critique. Look at how many wrong turns, quote, scientists have made throughout human history. You know, less than 100 years ago, they thought the atom was essentially looked like a cookie with all of the electrons where the chocolate chips just stuck into the nucleus. Um, you know, that was prevailing theory for a long time. And absolutely, it was wrong. It's been shown to be wrong. So, you know, again, don't trust me just because I say I'm trustworthy. Don't trust a scientist or a politician just because, again, well, here's, here's my next point. Should, should we trust scientists to be infallible? No real scientist claims to be. Um, and really, are they the most, are the people with the most integrity? Well, anybody remember Climate Gate from 2009? Now, there wasn't any specific falsification of data that was found, but there was something revealed in the email conversations and in the conversations of the scientists studying global warming that was very telling. Uh, the Climate Research Unit back in 2009 at the University of East Anglia, their email servers were hacked. Now, obviously, Hillary Clinton didn't take any note of that, otherwise she would have changed a few of her methods. But uh, one of the scientists, Kevin Trenberth, said, the fact is that we can't account for the lack of warning at the moment. And it is a travesty that we can't. So here we are, big big picture, let's look at the forest. We've shown you that thermodynamics, from that standpoint, CO2 doesn't matter. We've looked at the data charts and the, any minor fluctuations in temperature, any minor fluctuations are well within normal for the Earth. And then we looked at the data and it's, it's really not showing any warming trend of significance not within any tolerances, reasonable tolerances of error. And then we have this statement from one of the leading um, institutions for studying climate change in the world. And they're admitting that there is no warming. Again, quote, the fact is we can't account for the lack of warming at the moment, and it is a travesty that we cannot. The other thing is it shows that this entire group of people do not have science in mind. They have this, they have a preconception of what they were trying to prove before they even looked at the data. And when the data said something else, they called it a travesty instead of a success, a success of the scientific method, because they weren't using the scientific method. So again, you got to watch which scientists you trust. How about politicians? Well, <laughs> let me name a few that have led this country. Bill Clinton, you know, yeah, he stood up in front of everybody and says, I did not have sex with that woman and swore up and down multiple TV appearances. And then comes out later, of course, it was a big scandal. He was indicted or not indicted. He was impeached. How about Obama? Is he trustworthy? He's really tough on coal, isn't he? He's going to save the planet from coal. Oh, that evil coal. I'm actually going to come back to that one because that one's a good story. Hillary Clinton um, absolutely swore she did not send any classified information on her private email server while Secretary of State. And of course, that's turned out to be an outright lie. Why she's running around free is way beyond me right now. Um, CIA, we would never violate people's rights, U.S. citizens' rights. And of course, they've been spying on everybody. And, you know, the whistleblower for the, on the CIA is, of course, still in hiding overseas in a foreign, foreign country. Um, anybody remember high altitude nuclear explosions, Hain, um, from the 50s, 60s, and 70s? Um, I think it was mostly 50s and 60s, actually. Um, here's a picture of one of those explosions on the, on the screen. My question is, what kind of idiot politician decided it was a good idea to explode mul multiple nuclear bombs in the atmosphere? You know, this was during the time when we're, we're afraid of the atmospheric quality, the ozone layer, yada, yada, yada. And here we're sending nuclear weapons into space 
to see what they would do. We didn't even know what they would do. In fact, there was a surprise. Oh my goodness, the radiation traveled so much faster than we thought it would. You know, this picture is right over Hawaii. I'm sure they got a little extra radiation in their uh, in their lives. And totally, you know, no disclaimers, no nothing. It was, I'm sure it was top secret at the time. Um, and what kind of idiot politician would push such a program? So, again, don't trust politicians. Another couple of examples, the tobacco industry. You know, we subsidize something that kills cancer and we tax the heck out of it because, or, sorry, that causes cancer, tobacco. We subsidize those farmers. We subsidize them with tons and tons of money. Then we tax the heck out of their product, you know, at the consumer level. It's just ridiculous. Whoever made that decision had been going on for, you know, a better part of the century. And my last example of why not to trust politicians is uh, for, uh, pharmaceutical, the pharmaceutical industry in general. Uh, but there's one specific example that I have. Uh, I just read about it in August. Um, Flibanzarin. Um, it's a drug. It's essentially female Viagra. That was approved recently. The funny thing is it had been rejected twice. And there was no change to the data that supported its use or anything like that. But the third time around, it was approved. So all of this conversation around politicians and how we cannot trust them to audit the scientific method is they've shown over and over and over again that they are more loyal to special interest groups. And my last example is, can we trust Greenpeacers or any of the environmental groups to stay honest with the scientific method? And I would say absolutely not. I mentioned Obama, really tough on coal. One of his biggest backers, George uh, Soros, he recently bought millions, he, he allocated millions of dollars in sweeping up coal stocks that had bottomed out because Obama passed ridiculous regulations for coal plants. So do you think George Soros, who also funds Greenpeace and, and several other environmental groups, do you think he is really concerned about the environment or concerned about making more millions? Which, of course, he bought low. He'll, share, he'll sell them high and make billions. Um, so again, he's, he's busy you know, funding Greenpeace, funding this, that, and the other thing, whatever makes him rich, um, including wars in Africa. I have no, no idea what that guy is up to, but, uh, you know, he, he funded the war in Sudan. So, you can't really trust too many of the politicians. Or, you know, there, there are scientists out there that do absolutely have integrity and use the scientific method. But quite often, you're going to actually have to use what you learned in high school and in your science, science classes to really sort it out for yourself. And, and use the data. Use the data. Always require data. So, um, as I mentioned, we're here because Pope Francis thought that global warming was important enough, uh, was was a priority, really, and we need to start talking about it more aggressively. Um, I've shown you in, with data, with uh, a ton of data, and a lot of different reasons too, why that's a really silly thing for him to focus on. Um, this graph here on the chart is actually a graph of um, life expectancy versus how much carbon we've, uh, as a human race, have, has produced. And the more carbon we produce, the longer we live. And the longer our trees live, too. Again, trees love carbon. Uh, that's what they breathe. So maybe he should be less focused on CO2 and what CO2 does. And uh, focused on the items that I have on screen. You know, what should a true pope worry about? Well... Apostles, a, a true apostle is sent sent by God to convert, proselytize, and perform other works of mercy. And, you know, obviously we should be decrying sins and the pain and suffering inflicted on the human race by other humans and, and, and whatnot. Um, really, a true pope should, should really focus on, um, you know, those works of mercy and, and condemning the sins that cry to heaven for, for vengeance. You know, there's, there's four primary sins that are named in the Bible that really call down God's vengeance. One of them is willful murder. You know, the, the quote, blood of Abel in Genesis 4.10, uh, homicide, infanticide, fratricide, parricide, matricide, willful murder. Another one is sodomy, 
Genesis 17, same-sex acts, abuse of children, gluttony. The third one, oppression of the poor, Exodus 2.23, uncharity, slavery, marginalization. Uh, another thing that happens very commonly where, where uh, families have a very hard time feeding their children, giving them an education, etc. And the last one, defrauding workers of their, of their just wages, James 5.4. So uh, again, maybe a true pope should be focused on, on these things rather than on a hypothesis that the world might be warming and we might be causing it, which of course the data doesn't point to. On the screen here, I have intentional homicide rate per 100,000 people. This was a UNODC study in 2011. So it's a color-coded map of the world. You can get it again, UNODC study, just Google it, you'll find it. It shows essentially that with the, the homicide rate, and here's, I'll grab a couple of, um, worldwide, it's six to seven per 100,000. Um, the U.S. actually beats that significantly. We're 4.7 per 100,000, still bad. Russia's 9.2, just as a couple other data points. The U.S. is low, despite the fact that we're, we're one of the freest nations in the world with our Second Amendment rights, the right to protect ourselves with firearms. I, I thought that was interesting. But again, we're not talking about that. We're talking about intentional, willful murder. This next slide is um, suicides, self-murder. This is uh, a study that was done by the WHO, uh, WHO, uh, 2012. Again, another color-coded map so you can see where, where uh, um, suicide is a real problem in the world. Russia is actually terrible for suicide. Uh, the parts of Africa, India... Uh, the East Asia, really. Um, the U.S. is 12.6 per 100,000, significantly higher than murders. And you add them together, we're about 17 per 100,000. Russia, um, they're almost 20 per 100,000 on suicides. So there are about 28 uh, to 30 total uh, suicides and willful murders um, when you look at conventional murder. Worldwide rate for suicides, 16 per 100,000. I mean, that's a pretty sad story, but it gets worse. This, this graphic is a um, graphic of the world's abortion laws in 2015. And this map is just a witness to the pride and pugnacity of the devil. Notice the source. It's the Center for Reproductive Rights. Now, there's an oxymoron if I ever heard one. Um, this map is just the saddest thing I have to talk about today. Um, there are roughly 40 to 50 million abortions annually worldwide according to the WHO. One third of those happen in China. New York has a population of 17.8 million. So we're essentially aborting three, three New York cities per year. A couple other facts. 22% of US pregnancies are aborted. 3,000 daily. That means two every minute. Over 44% of Russian pregnancies end in abortion. Places like China and Vietnam are even worse, believe it or not. So, willful murder, obviously a problem in our world, but Francis wants to focus on global warming. The second thing I talked about is sodomy. Here's another graphic, color-coded again, so you can see where in the world sodomy, let me rephrase that again, um, same-sex marriage is now legal, including Ireland, you know, these, these Catholic countries, historically Catholic historically Christian countries were the first ones to legalize sodomy. That's pretty sad. Another thing that has, goes right along with that is the prevalence of rape. This map, this uh, color-coded map, um, is from 2011. Even if the global warming scare were real, do you think you could honestly push an agenda of change when you can't even stamp out human trafficking, rape, murder that occur daily. Um, I mean, it's, it's just sad. There's, there are countries here where we're in excess of, you know, 60 per 100,000 women that are, that have been raped at some point in their lives. Um, most of those are in Africa and the Middle East, but the U.S. is, is not exactly the greatest place either. Um, we're in 11 to 30 per 100,000 of our population. And in the Middle East, it's it's uh, not just women and, and young girls that have to look out. It's it's uh, boys. They have a terrible culture of that in the Middle East, especially. 
So, you know, those are a few things that maybe the Pope should, uh, you know, Francis should be really focused on rather than global warming. So what do we do going forward? You know, overcoming the obstacles. Um, I don't want to be, I mean, I shared some really serious stuff, but the message here, this climate propaganda versus the scientific method, I don't want it to be an onerous message. Um, so let's, you know, let's always put the solution front and center. Uh, before I say a whole lot more, I want you to think of something good. I've got a few pictures of, of nice things that I have that I like on the screen here. You know, I've, I've got a, um, I've got a picture of Mount McKinley uh, or Denali, if you will. Uh, I've got a picture of chocolate because I really like chocolate and I think it's good. And I've got a picture of chicks and bunny rabbits um, on a farm. Those are all things that I think are really good. Now, if I asked you to think of things that are bad, what would you what would you think of? I've got um, a couple of examples that I'll share. I've got, um, you know, a murdered woman laying in the street with onlookers. I've got a thief breaking into a car. I've got a beach on the ocean just absolutely trashed. There's, there's debris everywhere. There's tires. There's everything. Now, these are all things that I think are, are bad because although I'm not a global warming fanatic, I do believe in in uh, being a good custodian of God's gifts. You know, God gave the earth to Adam to keep, to manage. Um, and I believe that is a duty imposed on all of us. So, you know, the good and bad. Think of your own thoughts. And then we're going to move on to this, this next slide here. Um, I'm going to start with a, a simple question here. And bear with me. This is a fun application of the scientific method. It'll come full circle for you. Um, let's, let's take gravity, for example. How do we know that gravity exists? Do we measure? Can we sense it? No, no. Can we measure with our eyes or any of our sensors? No, we, we can't see it. We can't touch it. We can't taste it. But we can measure it. We actually can. We can measure its effects, right? Now, in science, is there a law developed around gravity? Is, is there a theory? Absolutely. Uh, we know that it exists. We can measure it, even though we can't see it, taste it, touch it, etc. Uh, one of the prevailing theories for hundreds of years was Newtonian's um, theory uh, of gravity. And it was a very, very good theory. It, it described a lot of uh, the observable world. Uh, the modern theory that governs the explanation of gravity is actually the uh, theory of relativity. And, of course, that dates back to 1915 with Einstein. Uh, really understand gravity as a curvature of space-time. Um, do we understand gravity completely? <laughs> Absolutely not. The theory of relativity is not a law. It has exceptions. And it lacks unification with another prevailing theory of quantum physics. So um, it's incomplete, if you will. We don't completely understand it. Now, imagine if it weren't there. Well, life would absolutely change. You know, for one thing, we'd all be floating through the room. We wouldn't be able, we wouldn't be mobile. We wouldn't be able to self-propel. You know, there's a lot of things that disappear when there's no gravity. Let's take another example. And again, bear with me. I'm getting to a point. Um, take the electron. You know, it hasn't been too long ago. We didn't even know that electrons exist. But can you sense, has anybody ever seen an electron? And if you have your hand up, you're a liar. Um, because absolutely no, yeah, electrons are too small to see. Nobody has ever seen an electron or sensed one, you know, with their uh, taste or their touch, etc. But we can measure its effects, so we know it's there. The prevailing theory uh, that describes electrons is atomic theory, you know, quantum mechanics. The electron was actually discovered back in 1869, and its effective mass was actually measured in 1909. But do we understand it completely today? I would say absolutely not. It's been understood as a particle and as a wave, and therefore we, we say that it exhibits particle wave duality. But what, what the heck does that mean, right? We don't completely understand the electron, but we do know it's there. We do know that it sometimes exhibits you know, wave-like characteristics and particle characteristics with mass. Now imagine if it weren't there. Well, maybe that one's harder to imagine than gravity, but uh, I can tell you that none of us would be sticking together. Like we wouldn't have function. Um, the world, well, I guess you could probably, if, if any of you are familiar with Bose-Einstein condensate, you can kind of imagine that, but 
it's kind of hard to imagine something that you can't see. Um, so anyway, moving on. God. We can't sense God. N not with our five senses. You know, a lot of people, they can f feel spiritually the presence of God. But with our five senses, we, we can't know God. Unless it's the, the host and the Holy Eucharist and the Mass. Uh, if we were the, one of the lucky ones that lived while he walked this earth. Um, but we can't measure his effects, can't we? We all know what's good and bad. We all have uh, the similar ideas for what's good and similar ideas for what's bad. And there's never been a culture in the world, in the history of the world, that hasn't believed in God, in a God. Some of them had the idea, you know, fairly twisted. Uh, the Aztecs come to mind where they sacrificed a lot of people, they murdered a lot of people. Um, in the name of, of worship, which was probably more satanic than anything else. But again, you know, these things, these measured effects show us as, as scientifically as anything else, as scientifically as we've proved the gravity or the electron that God is here present with us. So I would say that uh, to never be afraid to bring God into the conversation, you know, without God. Not only do we have no science, but, you know, we're, we're just placating the atheists, for one thing. And then without God, there's no definition of, of right and wrong. There's no definition of murder without God. Um, the unlawful killing of another human. You violated his rights. It might be shouted by an atheist, but why, why does the person have rights? Who gave him rights? You can break it down to the animal world, and, and there is no murder. Who gave him right? A right. His right is inherent? No, it doesn't work that way. We absolutely need God, otherwise the notion of right and wrong is meaningless. The notion of murder is meaningless without God. We can't even describe murders and rapes as being evil because evil has no description, no basis without God. And there's no definition of pollution without God. There's no definition of global warming without God. Um, you know, it's, it's hilarious that the same people, the same atheists that push global warming so hard um, have essentially self-defeated themselves. Again, don't be afraid to bring God into the conversation. On this, uh, this sheet, I have a list of all good, well, good uh, scientists are all Christian is essentially my catchphrase here. A list of Catholic scientists reads as a who's who in the realm of science. You have Galileo, Kirchner, Mendel, Gutenberg, Pasteur, Da Vinci, Pascal, Ampere, Coulomb, Volta, um, Bacon, Binet. I mean, half of these people, or almost all of these people, have various equations or even measurements in science named after them. It's uh, it's really amazing when you when you break it down to all real real scientists are Christian. They're all Catholic. Um, and if they're not Catholic, then they're at least um, believe in God, like Einstein. You know, there's a there's a few atheists running around today that claim themselves to be scientists, but you know they haven't added even a smidgen to our understanding of the world around us. It's it's really amazing when you look at it from that perspective. So, um, in all humility, you know, as we wrap this up, we let God work. God is truth, let him reveal himself as he is. God is truth, let him reveal his works as they are. None of us knows everything. Absolutely not. We should all acknowledge our shortcomings, constrictions, boundaries. Um, that's how the scientific method works. That's how God works. Um, and it works best when we're humble and open, uh, open to simply observing his goodness, his, his truth, his beauty. And be happy for crying out loud. No, we're not all here to be um, puddle clums. We're not all here to be, um, you know, down. And uh, we're here to be happy. We're here to know, love, and serve God so we can be happy with him. Um, at the same time, realize this is a veil of tears, not a utopia. You can take this message, and you'll probably get rejected nine times out of ten by a lot of people. Um, or a certain class of people, you know, the, the global warming folks, they simply will not accept this message. And, and so be it. You know, again, this is not our utopia. We will never make this world perfect. We are pilgrims on this journey. Um, there's a, a quote that showed up at the end of the movie. Um, 
it was uh, Our Lady of Lourdes, um, Song of Bernadette. For those who believe, no proof is necessary. For those who don't believe, no proof is possible. You're going to meet a lot of those folks in this world. You'll meet a lot of believers who will look at the data and go, ah, it's so obvious. Who will have their faith and say, oh, yes, it's so obvious. And then you'll have the doubters. So uh, in closing, remember the forest for, um, remember the forest as you look at your tree. <laughs> um, you know, we've looked at a very broad picture to tackle the tree of climate propaganda. Again, don't be bullied. Use the scientific method. Before we close, let's sum it all up. Let's never forget why we are here. Always, always bring God into the conversation. I'm going to do this every time. As a scientist, as a chemical engineer, I'm, I'm going to do this whenever possible because God is my best friend. There is no conversation in which he does not belong. Absolutely not. Until, also, until it's a law of physics, the topic is under review. So don't let anybody bully you by saying the science is settled. There are usually surprises when we look and use the scientific method. Otherwise, we're using it incorrectly. And, uh, and that's really telling of a lot of so-called scientists of our time of our day and lastly be happy we're christians we're catholic trust god and never forget why you are here i want to thank you all for having me tonight again thank you and good night